aggravated and mitigating um, events, and I would weigh those. And based on the law, I would look at, I, I would give the weight to how I feel it should go. Okay, but remember now, what, one of the very important things the judge told you was, if you have an aggravating circumstance and you think it warrants the imposition of the death penalty, and it's not outweighed by the mitigation, you would, you could vote for death, but you don't have to. Right. Right? Uh, do, do, can you envision a circumstance under which you could make a recommendation to this court for death despite your personal feelings? If the aggravated um, circumstances presented himself in that way, I could. Okay. All right. As it relates to your other duties and functions, weighing evidence, um, assessing credibility, do you have any concerns with your ability to follow the judge's no. instruction in that regard? Okay. And for the record, that's a no, right? That's a no. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Weiner. Um, Mr. Hood, how are you, sir? Good. How are you? I'm fine. Um, <coughs> You had indicated on your questionnaire that you were also a juror at some point in time, is that right? Yeah, I'm in California. Okay. Does that take long? It seems to me, I mean, I've never seen a trial go as long as anywhere in California. Did you have a, was it a long case? About five days. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't look so long now, does it? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of case was that? What kind of case was it? A DUI. A, D, a DUI case took five days? <clears throat> okay. And we're not that bad. Um, did you find that the judge's instructions on the wall were helpful in guiding you through the process? Guiding you through the process, yes. Okay. Now, you had indicated on your questionnaire, as I, as, as I spoke with one of your fellow jurors, that you had, before you came in here, strongly held preconceived notions about the appropriateness of the death penalty. Is that correct? I believe if anybody's convicted of killing somebody, they should not. Okay. And now that you know what the law is on that regard, you can have a, you can have a, uh, an accidental killing, which could be a manslaughter of types, and the law would not authorize a death penalty in that case. You can have a second degree murder, which is not involving premeditation, and the law would not authorize a death penalty in the case. And finally, not even all first degree premeditated murders warrant the death penalty, because that's the law. Do you understand that? You say so. Okay. Well, ultimately, the judge is going to say so. And the question becomes, for, for our consideration today, is can you set aside your strongly held beliefs, like Mr. Weiner and I just got done discussing, and if you get to the penalty phase, can you weigh the aggravators and the mitigators? It would be pretty hard for me. Okay. So you have a, a question in your own mind with regard to your ability to, to perform that legal duty. Like I said, it would be very hard for me to if the person is proven guilty. Mm -hmm. Okay, if the law instructs you that if the mitigators outweigh the aggravators, you must recommend life in prison, could you do that? I get that, but the mitigators have to be awful strong. Okay. In terms of the question I've been asking, the flip side for your other fellow jurors is, the guilt phase of the trial, would your personal feelings or opinions regarding the death penalty affect your ability to judge the facts in the case? No, I wouldn't okay. affect the facts. Okay. All right, thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Cherlis, how are you, sir? I'm good. Your questionnaire, you did not answer the questions on the death penalty, the A, B, C, D, E. So could you tell me, could you tell us so we know what your position is on the death penalty, if you have any opinions regarding the death penalty? No, I do know nothing about the case. Right? Okay. I'm not this bad from the Right? Have you given, prior to coming into jury duty here this last week and a half, have you given any thought to the death penalty? We're just looking to get a feeling or an, a, 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 a feeling for your opinions regarding the death penalty. I know you don't know anything about the case. Do you, do you feel you could make a recommendation for the death penalty to the judge? Yes. Okay. What you, you're thinking. Tell me what you're thinking about that. You heard the judge's instructions. Tell me what your feelings are on that. Uh, yes, Pastor, it's time for me. 
and you need that and that you you promise that because I have a Jewish tenure and I just want anybody talking about the success. Me? I don't say anything about it. I'm not following you you can't you can't say anything about <coughs> What, what do you mean by it? Tell me what you mean by that. Yeah, yeah, because uh, I, I don't know what happened to the different facts. Right, right. You don't know any facts. Okay, and, and I'm not asking you, again, this is, the point of this process is to get you to discuss or to commit to your ability to follow the law. So the first thing I want, I have to make sure is that you understand what the law is. Yeah. Do you understand? what the, the legal principles are at play here that we've been talking about? Okay, talk to me about like the concept of premeditation. How do you feel about what your fellow jurors and I have been discussing about the time frame that may be involved in premeditation? Let me ask, and I'm, I'm not, I don't want to put you on the spot. I'm just, do you, are you having a problem understanding some of it? I talk fast, that's one of the problems. But are you having a problem understanding some of the terms or concepts that we've been using? Yes. Okay, and, that, and that's fine. I mean, is, is, I take it English is your second language? Yeah. Okay, and I, did we talk already once or no? No, I don't, no. no because I remember, I mean, your Creole is probably a lot better than mine. Yeah. Okay, and I wish I could communicate to you in Creole, but... Do you have a concern that you could be missing some of the legal concepts that we've been discussing? No. You nodded your head yes, but you said no. <laughs> Are you backing with me or what? No. Okay. All right. As it relates to the death penalty, if at the conclusion of this case you determine that the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating circumstances, could you recommend a sentence of death to the judge? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. Um, Mr. Polykoff, right? Yes, sir. We did talk before, didn't we? Yes, sir. Okay. And we haven't talked about the death penalty, but again, you also had indicated, sir, on your questionnaire that you were up there as an A, right? That um, absolutely appropriate in every case where someone is murdered. Do you remember that in your questionnaire? Yes. Okay. You un do you understand now that the law is that it is not appropriate in every case where somebody is murdered? Okay, and so what you have to do in the end is weigh the aggravating circumstances against the mitigating circumstances. And if those mitigating circumstances outweigh the aggravating circumstance, you have to vote for life. Can you do that? Okay, the point ultimately is can you take your personally held opinion set them aside, and follow the law in the guilt phase of this case. Yes. All right. And your role as a juror here on the front end is to determine whether or not the state has proven the elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. Are you, you have, you are a man of some common sense? <laughs> well, do people, are you easily fooled by people? No. no. Okay. Right, and do you think you will be able to judge the credibility of witnesses in this case based on the court's instructions to you? Yes, I Are you a fair person? Yes, I am. Are you going to be a fair and impartial juror if you're yes. selected in this case? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Ms. Stetler. Yes. Is this your son? No. Oh, okay. We've been wondering, did the name almost felt any relationship? I'm sure there is, but I don't know how. Okay. Right. <laughs> because you, you, as we know from our previous discussions, are a longtime local resident, correct? Yes. All right. We spoke with you uh, at some length earlier. Um, anything that we've discussed up to this point in time that would lead you to believe you could not be fair and impartial in this first phase of the trial, the guilt phase? No. All right. As it relates to the to the penalty phase, you identified yourself as a B, which is generally appropriate with very few exceptions. Regardless of what your personal opinions are, the judge has now told you exactly what the law is. I've talked to your fellow jurors about it ad nauseum, I know. Mm -hmm. um,
do you feel that there's any problem on your part in following the judge's instructions, excuse me, on the law? No. All right? And if, in the end, you determine that we don't prove any aggravation, there's no aggravator in the case, the law is you must vote for life. Can you do that? Yes. Okay, because that's what the law requires of you? Yes. What did you think when we talked about premeditation? Are you fine with how the law defines premeditation? Yes. All right. Okay. Are you, do you want me to ask you no further questions? <laughs> you can ask me whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. We did spend time with you, and I, I don't, you know, don't want to go over and over the same subject. If you have any issues or concerns with any of the topics we've discussed up to this point in time? No, I don't. Thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Tabuto? Did I say that right? No. I did it? Oh, Ms. Grover. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm way off. I'm, You're on the right. I'm back the row. Okay, Ms. Ar... I mean, I might as well put you that one too. Help me out. Arkadapani. Arkadapani. Now, we have not spoken with you at all. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. I start off just quickly. The, the, law, the, the law is that everybody who walks that do, through that door must be presumed innocent by a prospective juror. That doesn't mean he's innocent. It means you must start off from that perspective. Can you accept that? And the reason is you don't know anything about this case, right? So here's a little trick. If I were to say to you right now, you've got to tell us what your verdict is, What's the, what is your verdict going to be right now? If the law says you must presume him to be innocent, and you haven't heard one shred of evidence, it would have to be not guilty, right? Does everybody understand that? The law requires you to presume him innocent in the absence of evidence. He's not guilty. Fair enough? It's my job to prove. My job and my job alone, Mr. Eisenhower and I, on behalf of the people, because we accused him of a crime, we've got to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Okay? Is there anything you think I could do in this courtroom, anybody I could call, any witnesses I could put on, any documents I could show you or photographs I could show you that could convince you that the earth is flat? No. You have no doubt about that in your mind? No doubt. Much less a reasonable doubt, right? Okay. So let's talk about the death penalty again. Again, the most important thing for you as a juror in this case is a commitment to do what? To care. Yeah. To the yeah. And to follow the law, right? So you had indicated in your questionnaire, I think uh, similar to, um, yeah, Mark, that you were a B, which is the death penalty is generally appropriate with very few exceptions, correct? Okay. Setting your, are you capable of setting your personal feelings and opinions aside and following the judge's instructions? It's already given you about how the death penalty scheme works. Can you do that? So I say to you, if at the end of this case, there's no aggravation, you're required to vote life, can you do that? Yeah. Or if there is aggravation, and you weigh it, and you say it doesn't, in my mind, weigh, it doesn't rise to the level of warranting death, you must vote life, can you do that? Yeah. And in the end, if you say there is an aggravator, a dead child, I think that's so weighty, it warrants the imposition of the death penalty, but there's all of this mitigation and I think the mitigation overweighs it, it would require you to vote life. Could you do that? Yeah. Okay. In the end, you, can you agree to follow the judge's instructions on how this process works? Okay. Um, what do you do for a living? I'm the owner of a website design and development company. Okay. And is that, do you, do you, do you have a storefront? You work out of the house? How do you do that? I have office space. Okay. Okay, that's the, because I have on here project manager, but that's what you do. Where did you get your master's? In Massachusetts. And how long have you been in St. Lucie County? Ten years. Okay. All right, thank you very much, ma'am. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Barnes, right? Good afternoon, Mr. Barnes. We had a long discussion with you when you came in last week, right? You had a statement written out and everything. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Barnes is very prepared. Um, one thing we didn't get to talk to you about, Mr. Barnes, was your feelings regarding the death penalty. Do you have any uh, personal feelings or opinions regarding the death penalty? I mean, it's not one of the first things I'm going to run up to, but yeah. Yeah. <coughs> What do you mean it's not the first thing you're going to run up to? What is that? Well, it's not the first thing that would be brought to my mind. It's 
not, oh, somebody died. Okay, that's kind of thing. No. Okay. Okay. And you understand now after, I mean, have you given, you, you do some, I think you indicated this, you're in school, and you have some legal or interest in the law or something like that? That's correct. Okay. And in that context, you've given no thought to the system, the, the structure, or how the death penalty works? Would you rephrase that? Yeah, just some, some of your jurors have come in here and said, I'm adamantly opposed to it. Some of them said, I'm, I'm strongly in favor of it. I'm just kind of trying to get a flavor for what your feelings or opinions are prior to coming in here. You know, I'm not for it and I'm not against it. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, that's correct. C is the, that's what you did for <laughs> When you have heard what the judge indicated regarding aggravators and mitigators, can you follow that instruction? Of course. Okay. At the end of the day, my beliefs really don't matter is what the law says. Okay. And is there anything about you that we should know that you think might make you anything other than fair and impartial and able to follow the law in this case? No. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Ms. Jones, yes. you were a juror in a prior case, right? Yes. And where was that at? It was in Oregon. Oh, out in Oregon? And how much different is how they do it in Oregon versus how they do it here? Well, I wasn't on a, on a, a case of this significance, and so I could spend two weeks <laughs> 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 going to be on a jury. You had it on their grand theft or something, right? Yeah, that's right. They, uh, all the difference was that the defendant's <coughs> mother worked for me. So it's, yes, yes. Okay. Did you do this? Did you do jury selection? Yeah, I was on the jury. And was it brought out that the defendant's mother worked for you? Yes, but it was a very small community, and the judge's position was, you know, <laughs> we'll never get a jury if we you know, get in the way. Basically. Okay. Well, you know, actually, when, when, you, when, when you were in that process, you were under oath to tell the truth at this stage, correct? Right? That's correct. And when they asked you if you could judge the case fairly, even though his mother worked for you, what was your answer? Yes. Okay. And what ultimately was your verdict? Guilty. Okay, so you, you, you fairly judged that case despite the fact you knew his mother, correct? Yes, that's correct. And this, again, that is such a, a perfect example of what I'm talking about when we talk about people's opinions and feelings and emotions <laughs> and those things that could ultimately affect or influence their verdict in this case, um, that those things are not to be considered. You, that's a pretty good rule, don't you think? Yes, I do. Okay. And do you see how that provides some continuity or, I don't say continuity, but at least a hope for a con consistency of outcomes, if you will? Yes. All right. Have you ever given any thought other than what you put on your questionnaire, which was C, to the death penalty? Yes, I thought about it. I, I, I've had trouble with it, but I know that there are circumstances in which it's, And in your mind, before you came in here, what kind of crimes did you envision were ones that might potentially warrant the death penalty? What what would have popped into your mind? Uh, well, m most of the things that were uh, significantly premeditated, uh, okay. like terrorist kind of things, okay. or they said the death of children, things that were just beyond the pale. And my question to you is, it, in your mind, is it only those types of cases that warrant the death penalty? Or can you conceive of the law recognizing other areas that might warrant the death penalty? I, I can conceive of others. I, I, my opinion has changed since I, I've been in here. And I think you've done an incredible job of... Hey, <laughs> not that. <laughs> ...of clarifying okay. that issue. But so, here's the deal. So, if a juror comes in and says, I, you know, well, I'm not in favor of the death penalty, but I could do it for Ted Bundy or the 9-11 killers, that's an extreme, that's not yeah. going to be your run-of-the-mill, there's no such thing run-of-the-mill death case, like there's no run-of-the-mill first-degree murder case, but you get where I'm going, right? I do understand. Okay, so all I want, I'm not saying I want it to be easy for you. I'm just saying I want you to follow the law and acknowledge that if it's warranted, you can do it. Can you? Yeah. The concept of, pre, of, of circumstantial evidence proving premeditation, does that make sense to you? Yes. All right. When I said that term, circumstantial evidence, did you immediately think, ah, oh, bad evidence, not good, reliable evidence? Well, no, I thought it was more loosely based than just a lot of things that would look like significant evidence until the judge said, well, it's not really significant. 
right. it would be a preponderance of evidence. The big picture, right? Yes. I mean, do you think, I mean, one of the things we talked about was eyewitness testimony. Oh, yeah, man, that's what I want. I want a guy who says he did it. But they can be wrong, can't right. they? Right. In fact, notoriously wrong. Right. Um, because would you agree that the Trump traumatic nature of a situation, the, the drama involved in a situation, can it impact or affect what a person recalls, correct? Yes, and, and they come with their own opinions when they're uh, observing something. Well, Alright, are you, you, I take it, based on what you told me, you're a fair and impartial person? Yes. You indicated in your questionnaire that you work, or you're an ED for a non-profit, what's the name of the non-profit? I was, I actually was with the YWCA okay. uh, at the end of my career. Okay. And prior to that, what did you do? I was also with a non-profit, I was executive director for a community action agency and anti-poverty organization. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Mr. Bowden, how are you, sir? Great, sir. We talked yesterday, right? Uh, or well, uh, not yesterday, man. If we talked yesterday, I'm going to jail, brother. <laughs> so I meant last week, right? You came in and we talked a little bit briefly last week. Um, I asked you, um, first of all, with regard to your questionnaire, you indicated family members, friends, associates who may be in law enforcement, right? Right. Can you promise us that that will not affect your ability to be fair and impartial in any phase of this case as the law would require? Absolutely. And will you assure us that when I call law enforcement officers in here to testify, you're not going to give their testimony any more or less weight just because of who they are? Correct. What about you, Mr. Bob? Did you ever have a bad experience with law enforcement? I've dealt with it, but nothing bad. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, What did you not hear me say, Mr. Bowden? I, I'm sorry, we got, I got over here, but it's your <laughs> fine, Mr. Rarick. What did you not hear me say about what the state must prove? This is going to be a real big double negative. For first degree murder. What did I not hear you say? Yeah, remember what I said was you got, I got to prove somebody's dead, I got to prove he did it, criminal act, and I got to prove premeditation. And then I defined premeditation. What did I not tell you I have to prove? What don't I have to prove based on that? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> no? Anybody got an idea to help Mr. Bowden out? Shadow of a doubt. Huh? Shadow of a doubt. Okay, that's the burden. You're right. I don't got to do that. Thank you for helping me out there. An element, right? There's three elements to it. There's somebody dead, it's criminal act, and it's premeditation. How about this? Why? You want to know why, Mr. Bowden? Yes. Do you? How about oh, you? I thought you asked me if I would yeah. I'm asking, do you want to know why? <laughs> what about, do you want to know why? Well, I'm curious, but I don't think it's all that much. All right, what do you think? I do want to know why. What's your name? Oh, Miss, Miss Lloyd, I'm sorry. Miss Lloyd, do you want to know why? Miss Stetlin, do you want to know why? Who wants to know why? But don't be afraid, you know, so there's a smatter of your hands went up. Now, the law says I don't have to tell you why, and I don't have to prove why. So if I don't have to prove why, who is going to make me prove why, if the law doesn't require it? Well, no, 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 I, I don't need anybody. But my point to you is, if the, law, if the judge doesn't instruct you that I've got to prove why or motive, are you going to make me prove it? No. Because that's not required. It's no different than holding me to a higher burden. Now, I may prove why, but I don't have to, Mr. Bowden. Can you accept that? Absolutely. Motive. Motive is not an element, but motive may provide information as to why, and or premeditation, and or any of the other elements in the case. Do you agree? I agree with that. Okay. If the law doesn't require me to prove something, are you gonna are you gonna acknowledge that and not hold me to a higher burden? Yes, sir. Understanding how the death penalty scheme works in the end of this case, <clears throat> you determine the defendant guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Consider what aggravators there are by law. You determine that the aggravator is sufficient to warrant the imposition of the death penalty and the outweigh the mitigator. Can you recommend to the judge a death penalty in this case? Yes, I can. Okay. You're going to follow your oath to follow the law? Yes, I will. Mr. Bob, thank you. Ms. St. Elliot. Ellen? Hi. You're new, too, right? We haven't talked to you? No. Okay. Uh, tell me what you do for a living. I'm a Oh, okay. So you you draw blood. Yes, sir. 
Ugh. <laughs> are, you, are you good at it? I'm not so bad. <laughs> you did it on the first shot, right? Okay. I mean, can I assume that when you're getting one of us in the, do you work for like lab four or one of them? Okay, so can I assume when the patient's there uh, and you come in and you're prepared to draw blood, you don't just kind of walk in, grab the needle, and hope you stick it, stick it in a vein, right? Okay, you're looking, you're trying to find the best vein, you're making a conscious decision to try to make this as easy on the patient as possible, right? Yes, sir. Is that because of your training and your educational background? Yes, sir. Okay. So you follow certain rules in that regard, and in this courtroom, the rule of, it's all right, I'll move on, sorry. The rule of law applies, and I've talked about that ad nauseum. Why, tell me why, do you think I keep harping on follow the law? And have you had, have, as I've talked to the 30 some odd jurors before you, has, has there been one of them that I haven't asked, will you follow the law? Because I want a commitment, because I want to make sure at the end of this case, when I'm asking you to follow the law, I know you've already committed in that regard. Are you committed to follow the law? Yes, sir. Do you have any preconceived notions of guilt or innocence in this case? No, sir. Right. The judge will talk to you about weighing the credibility of witnesses, weighing the, the, the quality of the evidence. Do you feel up to that task? Yes, sir. How old are you? Okay, so you're one of our younger jurors. I know we maybe have somebody in the early 20s, maybe 19. There's a, somebody was 19. Yeah, oh, there you are. Okay, good. So here's the deal. As I told Mr. Rivera, right, we were putting in a lot of time, everybody. And at the end of the day, I got to do something that's very uncomfortable with me, and that's take my case and give it to you. All right? And I do that with an understanding that you've agreed to follow the law, and more, not more importantly, but as importantly, to do your job and render a verdict. Are you willing to give whatever time it takes to do that? Yes, I can, yes, sir. Okay, and that's, okay, I, got, I hear what you're saying, but let's just talk now about, about the law. Here's the deal. We have had, in, in the past, a situation where an individual is picked for the jury. They've gone through this whole process, weeks of this, or as long as you guys have been here, and commitments to follow the law, whatever. And then they go out, and they're out, and they're out, and they're out, and then a knock comes to the door, and we're said, one of the jurors is balled up, crying in the corner. That person can't make a decision. You can't have it. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. And if anybody feels that way, it's here today and now that we got to be told that. That's why, who do you think? Do you think I like it? You know, I want to start trying a case too. But in the end, in two minutes I talk to you, i got to make sure you're not going to be that juror or any of your fellow jurors won't be that juror. You're not going to be that juror, right? When we talk about the death penalty scheme, because you and I haven't got to talk about anything, do you understand how it works now? Okay. Before you came in here, hey, what, I didn't look in your questionnaire. What was your letter? Do you remember what your letter was? Okay. Do you, do you have any feelings, strong opinions, one way or the other, regarding the death penalty before you walked in here? Um, well, it's pretty don't believe in it, tell me what, you got to try to quantify what that means for me. Well, I feel like you know, if it's not needed. Alright. Well, I mean, theoretically you could say it's never needed, I guess, and I've got to get to, to a point where I understand whether or not these feelings that you have about the death penalty could affect or impact your ability to follow the judge's instructions on the law. What type of cases do you think warrant the death penalty before you came in here? What were you thinking? Did you think give any thought to that? Okay. When you talk about your strong feelings of the death penalty, there's the first phase of the trial. And you get back in the jury room and it's 11 to 1, everybody's guilty. And you haven't yet made up your mind. But then you realize that if I say guilty, 
for going to the second phase, which could ultimately result in a, in a recommendation to the court, it's a recommendation to the court of the death penalty. Could that affect how you ultimately make your decision in that first part of the trial? Well, it shouldn't, because the defendant says not to think about the case of what's wrong. The operative board should Have her speak up, Mr. I can't hear her. you got to speak up just a little bit. She, she said it shouldn't. And so tell me, when you use the term shouldn't, that denotes to me or suggests to me you have some question in your mind. Well, there's no question. You guys said that that's still within our opinion. Right. This is what the law is. Okay. And so at that first phase, you could render a verdict knowing that it could result in going to a second phase? Yes. All right. So now in the second phase, if you believe the aggravators outweigh the mitigators, could your strong personal opinion prohibit you from recommending death if you otherwise thought it would be appropriate under those circumstances? No, sir. Okay. You could follow the judge's instructions on that? Yes, sir. Okay. And just remember, we'll mention, we'll talk about your other issue with the judge. That's his, for him to address. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Garcia? Yes, sir. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Did, yeah, we talked a little bit yesterday, right? No? No. You're another one we didn't talk to? That's correct. Okay. So first question is, I see that you might know somebody in law enforcement from down in Stewart and Martin County. Of course, as we've said over and over, the law is that cannot affect or impact your verdict in this case. Every case must be based on the facts. Can you agree to follow that law? Yes, sir. Furthermore, if a cop comes in and testifies, they're not entitled, she or he is not entitled to any more or less weight, can you follow that law? Yes, sir. All right. You are a bank manager, is that right? Yes, sir. You're like the branch manager of a whole bank? Yes. When you, who is responsible at the end of the day for making sure the till zero is out? I am. You are? Yes. Yeah? And so are you, like, when you balance your checkbook at the end of the month, this is so outdated. I mean, I'm such a dinosaur. But when you balance, back in the day, when you would balance your checkbook at the end of the month, did you have to zero it out, or did you get 10 cents here, 15 cents there, and say? I have to balance it at the end. Okay. All right. And, you know, that's always something I talk, I come back to this issue or this concept of reasonable doubt. You know, as a banker, that's how you guys are, and accountants are the exact same way, like we talked about engineers. You require an exactitude. But this is, this is a messy business in a criminal case, and it's not always going to be an exact, you know, match, if you will. Can you accept that? Okay. It's a question of assigning reason to what you might consider to be doubt. Are you a reasonable person? Oh, yes. Easily fooled? No. Okay. As your duties as a manager, are you called upon to handle HR matters, or do you have somebody who does that? Yeah, I do that, too. Okay. And that often requires you to kind of drill down and find out who's telling the truth, right? That is correct. All right. Some of these tools we talked about, are they helpful to you in assessing that in this case? Yes. Okay. Motive. Before you came in here, did you think that motive was something I had to prove to a jury? Actually, I didn't. Okay. I was wrong on that. That's fine. And that's the point of this exercise is, and there's going to be, I can't talk to you about all the laws you're going to see in this case. All I can get is a commitment out of you like I did with your other jurors that you'll follow whatever laws the judge instructs you on, okay? Yes. Can you accept that there's basically two golden rules, and these are great rules. Here's the first rule. What the lawyers say, at some point in time, Mr. Eisenhower is going to get up and give you an opening, maybe the defense gives you an opening. What the lawyers say about the facts in the case is not evidence, all right? The evidence comes from the, we're allowed to get up and tell you what we think the evidence will show, but we can't get up and, it's not, it doesn't carry the weight of evidence. Evidence comes from witnesses that are sworn. The second golden rule is, what the lawyers say about the law doesn't mean a hill of beans. The judge is the final word on the law, okay? Can you accept that? And can you agree that you will follow the judge's instructions on the law? We've talked at length. I just looked at your questionnaire, URAC. Sometimes appropriate, sometimes not. Given a lot of thought to this before you came in here today? No, but listening to everybody, it is a difficult choice to make. Okay. Okay. 
and again, the, the fact that it's a murder case and the fact that it involves somebody's life, the burdens, uh, the burden of proof is remains the same, whether it was a petty theft or this case. You got you, you with me on that? Okay. If the aggravation outweighs the mitigation, if you determine that it warrants death based upon a dead child, for instance, and it outweighs the mitigation, could you make a recommendation to the court for the death penalty? Do you see, do you believe that, um, the, the, do you believe that the, there's a pro proper role for the death penalty in our criminal justice system? Do you, well, do you believe it's a just and proper function of government in certain cases to seek the death penalty? Okay. And do you know, or do you agree, that if you didn't like the death penalty, of course, you would have to tell us here if you couldn't have followed the law. But if you wanted to change it, you don't make that change here in court. Where do you make that change? Tallahassee, the legislature, the other branch of government that deals with that, right? And that applies to every aspect of this case. Can you be fair and partial? And can you follow the law? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Galarza? Yes, sir. How are you, sir? Very good. We talked a lot yesterday with you. We did not get into details on the death penalty. I want to talk to you about all of this we've been discussing. You've indicated you're an A, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Do you recognize that there's nothing wrong with holding those opinions, but what I need is a commitment from you that you're going to follow the law? Do you recognize that? Yes, sir. Okay. So the judge will tell you, as we said over and over, if we get to the second phase of the trial and you determine there is no aggravation, that I haven't done my job and proven an aggravator, you must vote for life. Can you follow that instruction? Yes, sir. If I get to that stage and you found I've proven an aggravator, but you say, for instance, in the robbery one we talked about, you say, I don't think that aggravator is that weighty. I don't think it warrants the, death, the imposition of the death penalty. Can you follow that instruction and vote for life? Yes, sir. And finally, even if you find an aggravator, or dead child aggravator, for instance, but you find that there is litigation in the case that overrides that, and the law says you must vote for life, can you do that? Yes, sir. Because that's the law. Can you follow the law? Yes, sir. And we went on and on yesterday with you regarding your duties, but without rehashing, do you feel comfortable assessing credibility of witnesses? Yes, sir. Do you feel comfortable with the presumption of innocence and the burden of proof that we discussed it? And in the end, will you agree that you will follow the judge's instructions as he gives you on the law in this case? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Ms. Schultz was excused. Ms. Schultz was excused. Yes. And if I don't make a mark, I'm going to be calling uh, Mr. Barry and Ms. Schultz for the rest of the day. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Okay. Um, you are our train dispatcher. Yes, sir. All right. Are you still dispatching trains? Because you're fixing to get real busy around this <laughs> the woods, I think. Yes, Where did you do that? In Omaha, Nebraska. Oh, really? Okay. And how long have you been with us in St. Lucie County? Uh, three years, 1st of October. Okay. Um, with regard to your questionnaire, you've indicated family members or friends that were in law enforcement, correct? Yes, sir. Without going over it again, the law says, you know, that... that that should not influence how you ultimately determine the truth in this case. Can you accept that? Oh, yeah. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Right? Absolutely. I mean, wouldn't it be ridiculous if we were allowed to have jurors who say, you know, I have law enforcement, I believe everything law enforcement says, and if a cop gets up here and says he did it, then I'm going to find somebody guilty. That would be ridiculous. Yeah, it would be absolutely ridiculous. There are people. Why would I need you if we did that? It wouldn't. Um, will you... Um, apply. We talk about the rules of, of, of weighing testimony and uh, uh, credibility. Do you feel comfortable with that process? Yes, I do. All right. Now, you indicated on your questionnaire that you were in a C. Um, we haven't talked about that. You've heard the scheme. Did you, have you given any real thought to the death penalty or the death penalty scheme before you came in here to court this last week and a half? Well, I've thought about it for years. Okay. And, do you, and I know you don't have any strong opinions or feelings about it, but what were the things you thought about when you thought about it? 
that it's a deterrent for one thing. It may cause someone to stop whatever it is they were thinking about doing. Um, and in some cases, it is warranted, I think. Okay. Yeah. And that's on a case-by-case -case basis? Absolutely. When we talk about, Mr. Barry, when we talk about aggravators, what the judge told you was it increases the gravity of a crime. So when we go back to our, you know, our hypothetical running the light and so forth and causing injuries, as I added facts, those aggravated or increased the gravity of the crime, right? Correct. That's how it works. Do you feel comfortable with that? Oh, yeah. And can you follow the judge's instructions on the law in that regard? Yes. Are you a fair and impartial person? I think so. All right. If, I had to, if you had to pick between weighing, uh, using your common sense to determine the credibility of a witness or looking at the witnesses, um, uh, the, the consistency between the witness's testimony and the evidence, which one is the one you're most likely to rely on? The evidence. I don't think there's anything such thing as common sense. We're all different. Holy mackerel, there's no such thing as common sense? Right. We're all different. Okay. But, I mean, um, you, have you ever seen anything in, in well, okay. I'm going to leave it at that. All right. I just want to make sure that as you say that, you're not somebody who is easily fooled or misled no. or confused. No. Okay. Are you a detailed man? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. You're going to follow the law, Mr. Barry? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Minerva. Yes. So we talked a little bit before. We did not talk about the death penalty. Let's talk about your case for a moment that you were a juror in, the murder case. Was it here or somewhere else? Judge McCann. It was over in Judge McCann's courtroom? Yes. How long ago was that? Four or five years ago, I guess. Okay, and it wasn't either Mr. Eisenhower or I who were trying it? I don't believe so, no, sir. Okay. Was it a death penalty case or no? Um, no, sir. Uh, no, sir. Okay. Um, when you got, regardless of whether it's a, a, a first degree murder case without the death penalty or with the death penalty, I assume when you get back in that room, it's everybody appreciates the gravity of the situation. We've all been talking about that. We're talking about life on both sides of the equation, and it's a big deal. When you got back there, did you have any issues with anybody who began to maybe address issues or, or raise topics that shouldn't be discussed in the jury room? No. No? Okay. Did anybody express any bias or any prejudice or anything of that nature? No. And had they done that, Mr. Minerva, tell me, are you the type of man who would have spoken up and said, look, that's not to be discussed. That's not part of the legal basis upon which we can render a verdict. Correct, yes. That's the kind of person you are? Okay. When we talked about, when you heard for the first time that this is a case in which the potential penalty of death is at stake, what did you think? Um, based on what was given in the news. Okay, don't talk about that. Um, I, I took everything with a grain of salt. Right. Which is what I said last week. Right, that is what you said. And when we talk, but, but as we talk about the potential penalty, do you, do you foresee any problems in your ability to consider the possibility of making a recommendation of death to the court? No, sir. Okay, can you follow the judge's instructions in that regard? Okay, and it, do you realize, sir, Mr. Minerva, that this is not a numbers game? Okay, so for instance, if I have five aggravators and there are no mitigators, that doesn't mean you could find the death penalty because you might say none of those aggravators in my mind warrant the death penalty. By the same token, there could be 50 mitigators and one aggravator, just one, that you believe is so weighty that it overrides the mitigators and, based upon that, can recommend death. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. And do you accept that as a law, and can you follow that? Of course, yes, sir. You're going to follow the law? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Wilson, we talked a lot yet? Last night, you know. Mm -hmm. You're our TFA guy, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, we did not get to talk to you about your feelings or opinions regarding <coughs> the death penalty on your questionnaire. You indicated you were an A, right? Okay. And now you know what the law is, like this gentleman over here and I just discussed, that 
the, the, the death penalty is not appropriate in every circumstance, not authorized in every circumstance in which there is a murder. Can you accept that? So, for instance, I say to you, um, New Year's Eve, I go out, I shoot off a gun. What goes up must come down. And I hit somebody in the head and I kill them. That's a manslaughter. You can't get the death penalty for that in the state of Florida. Second degree murder. I'm driving down the street. I got a beef with a guy. I drive by his house. I see the lights on. I figure I'm going to throw a shot through the window just to scare the heck out of him. But unfortunately, I hit somebody in that house and kill him. It's not premeditated murder, but it's second degree murder. You cannot get the death penalty for that. Finally, first degree murder, a premeditated planned murder, if there's no aggravators, you cannot get the death penalty for that. You would have to vote life. Could you do that? Yes, sir. And, and ultimately, also, if you found there were sufficient aggravators, but the mitigators outweighed them, and the judge said you would have to vote life, could you do that? Yes, sir. Because that's the law? Yes. All right. And you're a fair man? Yes. Keep an open mind? Yes, you judge, will you judge these witnesses based upon what they said and did, and not based on who they are or what they do for a living? Well, I ask you, should everybody who comes through that door as a criminal defendant be treated fairly? How do you sh how do you ensure that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Speak say that again. one more time. I think Mr. Eisenhower unscrewed my coffee lid when I wasn't looking. <laughs> quite sure. That's probably designed to shut me up. But okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. Um, Mr. Grobart? Grobart, I'm sorry, sir. Um, okay, and we spoke to you, too. You're our PSL inspector, right? Yes. Um, now we've got an opportunity to discuss in more detail um, what your duties and responsibilities are as a juror, right? Do you understand them? Yes. Have you been a juror before? No. What did you think? You didn't raise your hand. What did you think when you got that jury summons showed up in your mailbox? What's the first thing that popped into your head? Sitting in a room. Sitting in a room? Do you think you'd be sitting in the room for a week and a half? No. Okay. Um, you indicated, sir, on your questionnaire that you were a B, uh, uh, which is more, you know, generally appropriate with few exceptions. Mr. Wilson and I and Mr. Galarza and I have now discussed how that's not the law, right? Correct. And can you agree that you would set aside any strongly held opinions you have on the propriety of the death penalty and follow the judge's instructions on the law? Yes. Okay. So you're going to weigh the aggravators against the mitigators and if the law requires you to return, I mean, have I done or said anything to you t today that would suggest I want you to do anything other than follow the law? No. And so if you determine the mitigators outweigh the aggravators and the law says you must recommend life, is that what you'll do? Um, I forget who it was, uh, um, I think it was Mr. Denmark and I talked about um, premeditation. Yeah, it was Mr. Denmark. And when I read Mr. Denmark and the rest of you, the instructions on premeditation and the time must elapse, and we use that analogy, did that make sense to you, or was that something that was inconsistent with your preconceived notions about what premeditation might be? It was close. Close? Okay. All right. And do you have a problem with applying that particular theory of law? No. All right. Do you play golf? No? Do we have any golfers here? Yeah. What's your name? Sam Hazel. Sam Hazel. Mr. Hazel, are you a good golfer? Not really. But, yeah. A 10 handicap? That's a good golfer. That's pretty good. Okay, so you're a 10 handicap, right? Mr. Hazel, do you know, do you follow any golf, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Grover? On TV? Yeah. Who's the number one golfer in the world right now? Day, is it Day or is it uh, Rory? No, it's Jason Day. Jordan Speed? I don't know. I think it's still Rory, but I, I, well, I, let's just assume for the sake of this conversation that it's Rory. You think that Mr. Hazel could beat Rory McElroy? No. Don't follow with that. Well, he just told you he's a 10. Doesn't mean because you don't know anything about golf. Who knows something about golf? Okay, what's your name? Again, I'm sorry. Jones. Miss Jones. Jones. What do you think? Can Mr. Hazel beat Rory McIlroy? No. Unlikely. Well, 
It could, couldn't it? <laughs> you, you, all right, that's a good point, Ms. Jones. Mr. Hazel says, what if I play from the ladies' tees? You think he could beat Rory from the ladies' tees? I doubt so. Right? <laughs> Ms. Roberts, you say it's possible? Or Ms. Martin, I'm sorry, Ms. Martin, you say sure. it's possible? <laughs> okay, so let's say that Rory McIlroy has the worst day of his life, and good old Mr. Hazel has the best round he's ever had. You think he could beat Rory? It's possible, isn't it? Okay. Mr. Hazel, you think he could beat Rory? On his worst day of my life. His absolute worst day. <laughs> then yeah. You do? Yeah. Wow. Okay. It's possible, I guess. It's possible. But on his best day, do you think his best, his, his best day, your best day? No. Not even close? No. But it's possible too, isn't it? No. It's not possible. <laughs> I guess the point is, Ms. Martin says it's possible before we got to the extremes of it. And so when I'm talking to you guys about the days of the doubt, you know, what is reasonable versus what is possible, imaginary or speculative, probably pretty speculative for any of us to think, and I know you don't know a lot about golf, but to think that Mr. Hazel could beat Rory McIlroy. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. And for you to think otherwise would require you to really speculate, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's deep And no offense, I mean, you, you kill Mr. Eisenhower, Mr. Hazel, I can assure you. I've seen him golf this morning. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you very much. I appreciate it, sir. Mr. Uh, Tupita, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we spoke at length again uh, yesterday as well, right? Yes. Um, just to touch on quickly, you indicated in your questionnaire you were a prior juror. Is that correct? That correct. Was that a criminal case? It was. And was it here or somewhere else? It was in St. Lucie County. Okay. Do you remember what kind of case that was? Um, it was a prescription drug situation. All right. Did you all arrive at a verdict? We did. And what was that? Uh, guilty. Okay. Now, during the course of those deliberations, again, I'm looking for, did you have a crying juror? Did you have a juror who tried to address or inject something from outside the courtroom into the case? Did that come up at all? We had a little back and forth with a couple of jurors that weren't really under, you know, they weren't listening to the evidence. Okay. And after deliberating, they ultimately, uh, you know, followed the law. Okay. And that's how we came up. So, you know, like I'm thinking, in my mind, these are the things that, you know, your case, for instance, a prescription drug case, total scourge on society, the impact it's had on the lives of people who have been soccer moms who have become addicted to drugs after having a tooth extracted, or whatever the case might be. And all those things are mitigating circumstances in nature. But when you're back there as a juror, somebody shouldn't be raising you know, well, she only had a tooth pulled, or whatever the reasoning for what she did might be, unless it's a defense, right? Correct. Okay, so what I talked to you guys about all along has been what the elements of the crime are, what I've got to prove, he did it, beyond a reasonable doubt. What I haven't talked to you about are defenses. Okay? What, and you, if you had to come up with a defense, what's a defense in your mind? What could be a defense? I'm not talking about just this case. I'm talking about under any circumstances. Um, you know, uh, your stance is to the circumstances, basically, uh, defending your integrity and what took place uh, in the evidence, and what took place and how it took place. So, you know, the law defines what the aggravators are, the law defines what the mitigators are, the law defines the elements. The law also tells you what defenses are. And defenses, just like crimes, have elements. So, for instance, somebody up here and I talked about insanity. And there would be a long instruction on what, you know, you, you don't, somebody isn't insane just because they howl at the moon. There would have to be criteria that would have to be met. Can you accept the proposition that a defense, to the extent it is a defense at law, has got elements that you would have to follow just like anything else in your duties as a juror? Yes. Okay. Now, I didn't talk to you when we talked individually about your position, Mr. Tabuto, on the death penalty, but you had indicated... You were the middle of the road guy, right? Yes, sir. Do you see or foresee any problems or concerns in your mind with your ability to carry out your duties in this case? And should you deem it appropriate based on the aggravator versus the mitigators to make a recommendation of death to this court? 
after listening to the whole process and the fact that it's a recommendation, you know, not my burden only. Okay. It makes total sense that, um, that you know, you follow the law and, and you present that. I don't want you to minimize that role at all. And you must understand that what the judge told you is it is a recommendation and the final decision is left to him, but your recommendation carries great weight. Okay? Are you still all right with that? Absolutely. Okay. You indicated on your questionnaire you might have had family members or friends, had a run-in with the law, anything about that case or experience that could affect your ability to be fair and impartial to anybody here? No. Promise us you'll leave that outside. That has nothing to do with this case. 100%. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Mr. Stanley, how are you, sir? Good. Yourself? I'm fine. Um, we talked uh, a little bit the other day, I think, right? Um, same question I talked to Mr. Tabuto about. You indicated family member, or friend, or somebody you had running with the law. Anything about that situation that could create a problem with your ability to be fair and impartial in this case? No. Okay. Now you indicated because we didn't get to talk to you about um, uh, specifically the death penalty that you were a B uh, on the questionnaire. Do you recall that? Uh, no. No. Okay. That's fine. And, and a B was whatever, I can't remember, uh, appropriate most of the time, inappropriate sometimes, something like that. But do you understand how the process works, that we've got two phases? The first one is, did he do it? Do you understand that? Correct. Do you see any problem in your ability to be a fair and impartial juror on the front end of, did he do it? No, I don't. You're going to make me prove it? Yes. Because that's my job, right? Yes. And that's the law. Number two? If you determine he is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, can you set aside any preconceived notions or opinions that you have held or hold about the death penalty and make a recommendation to the judge based on the law? Yes. So if the law requires you to make a recommendation of life, will you do that? Yes. Because that's what the law requires? Yes. Okay. What did you think about circumstantial evidence? I mean, could you imagine any other way I would go about proving premeditation? other ways to prove premeditation. Okay. But I'm saying if if I use circumstantial evidence or rely on circumstantial evidence to prove, let's say, motive or intent, can you accept that that's a, a legal way for me to prove those things? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Kalindo. Yes. How are you? Good. You? Good. I didn't never get a, I didn't never get a, I do not have a uh, occupation for you on my questionnaire. Are you a student? Are you, what's your, what is your occupation? Um, uh, I'm employed. Okay. You are how old? 19? Yes. Okay. So what did you think about um, when we were talking over here with my friend from the bank about the crying jerk not being up to the task? She was a young girl. And it all, she just got overwhelmed. Thought she could do it. She told the attorney she could do it. And when it came down to it, she just couldn't do it. It was too much. But did, did that resonate with you at all? Um, well, yeah, I remember saying it. <laughs> I know you remember me saying it. I'm just wondering, did you think to yourself, gosh, could that be me? I'm not picking on you because you're, yeah, I'm picking on you because you're 19. So <laughs> do, do, is, is there, in your mind, do you think that that could be you? All right, good. So let's say my good friend here, what's your name? What? No. Mr. Howard. Mr. Howard's a little older than you. Uh, you know, a couple of years is your senior. <laughs> All right? So you and Mr. Howard are serving in the jury back there. And Mr. Howard and 10 other jurors have decided that Mr. Eisenhower and I failed miserably. We did not meet our burden of proof. But you are convinced after reviewing the evidence and looking at the, do uh, the, the photographs and listening to the testimony that we absolutely proved our case beyond a reasonable doubt. And Mr. Howard says to you, look here, dearie. I've been around a lot longer than you. I've been on this world a lot, on this planet a lot longer than you. And I know the way it is. What are you going to do? I'm going to um, stick with what I think. Yeah? You don't think Mr. Howard has got more life experience than you? 
I'm sure he has more life experience than I do, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, what he thinks is in accordance with the law, everything that we've been shown. Okay. So now I take it a step further. Not only are you not going to cave to Mr. Howard, you've got all 11 of them now. Are you, do you feel, and this is an extreme, right? yeah. but I, I don't want to see you come out of your crying. <laughs> so will you get back there and stand up and fight for your position? I don't care what the position is. You don't know what it is. I don't know what it's going to be. It's going to be your view of the evidence, but will you stand, stick to your guns and hold to your position if you feel it is in accord being you, you arrive at it in accordance with the law. Um, yes, unless um, like like we said earlier, with discussion in the uh, amongst the jury that if somebody like brings up something that I uh, fail to realize, um, then I will stand by what I um, you know have concluded. From the you can recognize that your initial assessment might have been flawed, yeah. and Mr. Howard might have some good points, and you'll listen to that. Yeah. Right. The point is, I'm asking you, or what I want you to understand is that when you get back there in that first phase of the trial, your vote is as equally as important as everybody else's, because you must all agree unanimously on the verdict. Okay? okay. All right. I want you to keep an open mind, I want, but I want you to participate, too, because your vote counts. Are you going to participate? Yeah. All right, and then when you get to that penalty case as a 19-year-old adult in this country, you're being tasked with the responsibility of determining whether or not a recommendation should be made to the court for life or death. Do you feel you're up to that task? Yes. Okay. You held, I think you put down a D on there, right? And now we've talked with many of your fellow jurors that that's fine, but in the end, your verdict, your, your recommendation to the court has to be based upon the aggravators versus the mitigators. And if the mitigators outweigh the aggravators, you must recommend life. Can you follow that instruction? Yes, sir. Okay. Any reason you can envision that you would be unable to follow the judge's instructions on the law in this case? Yes, sir. All right. What do you want to be someday? Uh, uh, I don't really know at this point. Okay. All right. Are you going? Are you going to school or intend on going to school? What's your plan? Um, well, uh, you know, last year a lot of things came up. Okay. So I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to do. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, and, and we appreciate uh, your honesty. Um, Ms. Sanat. Senate. Senate. I'm sorry. I see you back there. We talked a little bit uh, the other day, right? Yes, we did. Okay. Um, you're one of my teachers. Yes, I am. What do you teach? Ninth grade freshman seminar and eighth general paper. What? <laughs> eighth general paper? Eighth general paper. It's a college level class that comes to university. It's a writing course based on current and past history. Okay. So this is like IB type stuff? or? We're better than IB. <laughs> and look, you know, that, that, wasn't a, that wasn't even on the radar when I was in school, you know. It was just get in, get out. Um, there are a lot of burdens on it. A lot of the testing and the, the school is just br br brutal, brutal. Um, you have developed, I, I want your fellow teacher and I talked about maybe the other time. You guys start off you know, with all these lofty aspirations, and then you become somewhat jaded? Jaded is the word. Where are you in your in shades of jade? Um, because I teach ninth grade. Yeah. I tell my students that when you walk in here, I don't care what you did last year. When you walk in here, I tell my students that you have to be a brand new deck, and every single day is a brand new deck. So, somewhat jaded. You know, we've talked, um, my friend who wants to be a forensic psychologist talked about uh, free will, and I couch it in terms of free will and personal responsibility. I mean, you talk to these kids about decision, you know, it goes, what they used to tell me was going on in permanent record. 
you know, now everything is a permanent record. But do, do you have those types of conversations about, look, choices you make, you're going to have to accept the responsibility for those choices. Do you talk, have those kind of conversations? The other side they think is called freshman seminar, mm -hmm. and it is um, character education, career and college readiness. And the one thing that I always say to them is, no, you don't have to do anything in my class, but the consequences are you will fail my class. So your decision has consequences. Every decision has consequences. Aren't you worried about not getting a raise if you fail somebody or they don't test right? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know what that word means. <laughs> All right. I didn't, hey, trust me. So, that, I mean, you, do you strongly believe in that, that, that theory of personal responsibility? Absolutely. Should people be held accountable for their volitional actions? 100% agree with that. Okay. Do you have any concerns or reservations about your ability to serve as a juror in this case and assess the credibility of witnesses? No. Not at all. In fact, would you suggest that perhaps you might be particularly well suited in light of your experiences over the years? Probably more so than some people. Okay. Um, you indicated, oh, family members or friends in law enforcement again? No, they will have no impact on them. Treat them the same and not Absolutely. come in here with any biases? All right. Any ever have a bad experience with a law enforcement officer? Um, a state trooper had short man syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. I mean, that's, you got to go there. Um, okay. And he felt the need to lecture me for about 25 minutes. So okay. Other than that. <laughs> um, and as you indicated on your questionnaire, you are uh, a C. Appropriate yeah. some, not appropriate others. Understanding what the judge's instructions on the law are. Are you comfortable with that? I'm comfortable with the instructions. Okay. Um, a lot of thought into the death penalty. Um, you know, in theory, I have an opinion, and then when it becomes a reality in a setting like this, uh -huh. I'm not 100% confident that I could vote for the death penalty. All right. Do you feel, again, is that you have, is this a religious, philosophical, moral? And I don't want to say moral, but I'm more moral than no. anybody else in here, but I sort of feel, I, for me personally, I think I would have a hard time um, voting for a human being. Okay. And so, despite what the judge's instructions are on this weighing process to you, it's just a question of whether or not in your heart, your mind, you have a reasonable doubt regarding your ability to carry out your duty. Do you have a doubt in your own mind? No. I know that I would be fair and impartial. I would listen to everything. Um, it's just it's something that is weighing on me whether or not I could go to the death penalty. And that, that's what we're getting. That's what I'm getting at. My point to you is the issue is can you follow the law? And so yes, if the aggregate, if the aggravators outweigh the mitigators, and you thought it was an appropriate case for the death penalty, could you vote for the death penalty? I'm not 100 percent sure I could. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Welsh, yes. how are you? I am fine, thank you. Okay, good. And so we talked a little bit too. You're another one of our bankers. Are you uh, getting to the zero mark at the end of the balance sheet at the end of the day? No, I was a lender. Oh, a lender? I did not. For a while. For a long time in my life. When a guy or a gal walked in looking for a loan, did you just look at them and say, yeah, it looks like a solid candidate, and then stroke them a check for a couple, ten grand? <laughs> what got, you made that decision based upon facts, right? On paper, facts. Okay. So I could, I could check those facts. And I assume in the bank at which you work, they had certain criteria that you had to, thresholds that had to be met and so forth, right? Okay, and so the law here is very similar in terms of before you can find somebody guilty, you got to have X, Y, and Z. You recognize that? Right. There's kind of a similarity, if you will, I mean, between that and this. Um, when I talked about circumstantial evidence, at what point in time did you think that box was mine? I know, Mr. Howard, it's a state box. At what point in time did you think it was my box? Um, well, I think I... 
beginning thought it was provocative. And I thought it was, you know, it was fun. But when I really knew it was provocative was when you picked it up and your name was on the box or the book was, your name was on the book. Okay. You know, then I think it was provocative. And so by that point in time, I was through it quite a bit. There were a lot of facts, right? Yeah. Or, and each of those are facts. It's just the totality of those facts led to a conclusion. And that can be applied to what we're doing here in this process, correct? Right. And it goes back to, you remember we talked very early this morning about expert testimony and garbage in, garbage out? Do you think, you remember that? Yes. Okay. Do you think that an expert witness can ever have too many facts? Can there be too much information to base their opinion on? Probably. You think so? Yeah. Okay. And can you recognize that, the, that, that an important thing in assessing the credibility of an expert witness is to look at the, it's not quantity necessarily, but the quality of those facts upon which they're relying. Can you accept that? Yes. And that's what I mean by they could have more information than we want to hear. Mm. It will vary from important stuff. I see. Okay. Now you indicated on your questionnaire that you were a C as well, correct? Okay, and as you considered what we've been talking about here, how do you, what is your level of comfort with your duties and responsibilities in this trial after we've, you've determined that the defendant is guilty, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt and moving to the next phase? I can follow the judge's directions and follow the law. Okay, and you feel comfortable with that? I'm comfortable. You know, you know you better than anybody and you feel that you're up to that task, correct? Right? Let me ask you, what would you do if we go back to the, the, the scenario of the crying jury that I, juror I talked to you about? If you were back there, not crying, because I don't see you crying, um, how, what would you do in an effort to bring that juror back into the fold, into the deliberations? Well, that could be difficult, because that could be a person who couldn't be brought back in the fold. They may not be, um, I don't want to use the word they may not be emotionally capable yeah. of coming back into the fold. Right. And at that point, you know, we need to have a four-person and a four-person. That's my dad to do something. I was on a trial. Okay. And I had a juror who slept through the entire thing. Out here? These guys have all been sleeping all morning, you know. All the judge thought, everybody thought, I, listen, if you get on this jury, don't think you're going to be able to sleep. We, we, that doesn't work here. I couldn't figure that out. Okay. All right. Um, anything about you that you think, I mean, are you a, are you a fair person? Yes. And, again, you'll make your decision in this case, just like in life, important things based, important decisions based upon the facts and the evidence? Yes, I will. I thank you very much, ma'am. I appreciate thank it. You. Mr. Burge? Yes, sir. How are you? We have not spoken? We have not spoken. Okay. Um, oh, another one of our teachers? Yes, sir. What, did, what do you, did you teach? I currently teach 7th uh, and 8th grade uh, civics in the U.S. history. <laughs> okay, so has, have I been fairly accurate as to how the government works in terms of the branches and where we make changes to the law from a civics class oh, perspective? Definitely. Okay. Legislature makes the decision. What, what about um, that, that statement that I made about do you feel that, that the potential imposition of the death penalty is a proper and moral function of government? Do you think that's a proper function of government under the right circumstances? It is under the state of Florida's law, and each, each state determines what that uh, philosophy will be as far as the death penalty is concerned. Right, and I'm asking for your personal opinion about that. I believe that it's a proper thing for the state of Florida and also for, for us here in the state to do. Okay. And we talked um, at, do you ever talk in your civics class about this topic? Or would this be something that would come up in civics? Uh, if, maybe not necessarily the death penalty, but the, ju the, the jury system, the, the uh, judicial system, and uh, things in regards to making, making good choices. That's talked about free will earlier, right. and I talked to my students about that uh, 
frequently because of the age bracket they're in, because of uh, the seventh and eighth graders, the influences that they'll have on each other, uh, and the choices that they need to make when they are potentially being influenced by each other. A lot of bad consequences to some of the decisions kids make nowadays. Uh, they can be, but you can, as a teacher, you can also try to help them to be able to, if they realize they're going to be in a bad situation, how to remove themselves from that so that they are no longer a part of what could or could not happen. Are you a big advocate of this concept of free will and, and personal responsibility? No, I, I would just say maybe personal responsibility because that's, that's basically it. I mean, you know, and I use a lot of examples. Uh, uh, you used one earlier about driving. Uh, and I'll use that example also. If you're doing 45 miles an hour, 45 mile an hour speed limit, no one's going to bother you. But if you're doing 50 or 60, someone's going to, someone is is entitled to bother with you, and also someone should bother with you because you're breaking the law. And you know, we all have, we all understand what it means to follow the law out there, and that's, I think that when we get in here, it's, it's a, it's a different. It's a difference of degree, not of kind, though. I mean, the law is applying here, and I need a commitment from everybody that's going to follow the law. Did it come as a surprise to you that I've stood up here now for several hours and to many of your fellow jurors over the last week talked about their responsibility or obligation to follow the law? Did that surprise you? No, because that's part of your responsibility in order to help, help the potential jurors understand what their responsibility is. When I said that, when I mentioned the concept of jury nullification, I understand it. Okay, tell us in your opinion what deleterious impact or effect jury nullification has on the system. Well, it had in the 50s, in the 1950s especially in the South, uh, because um, whenever someone who would be coming up in front of a jury, and juries were made up of basically. Uh, white males at that particular time, and the good old boy system and such, and just, uh, oh, don't worry about it. And we saw this very much in the civil rights era, especially in Mississippi and Alabama. So jury nullification uh, you know, happened during those particular times. I don't know that jury nullification is happening in these times today. And I guess the, the point I would ask you is if you're a juror in this case, and you get back there, and somebody says, I don't care what the evidence says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to disregard the law, I'm going to disregard the evidence, and I'm going to render a verdict, because I have certain feelings or opinions. What are you going to do? I'm going to take and ask them, you know, we're going to have to go through that process. Okay. You're going to have to, you know, and then try to, you know, reason with them that what they're doing is not correct. And they, they need to follow the law, the instructions that were presented by the judge, and, uh, uh, and work through that. And as you pointed out, for as long as it takes, until we really don't feel that we can okay. change that, get that person to come around to follow the law. Now, you uh, indicated on your questionnaire that you were a C in this death penalty uh, questionnaire. And do you, before you came in here, any strong feelings or opinions? that you think could affect your ability to, excuse me, weigh the mitigators and the aggravators? No. Okay. You're going to follow the law, sir? Follow the law. Okay. Constructed. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, Ms. Cameron Colker. I'm Cosper. Cosper. How are you? I'm okay. Um, so you raised your hand a couple times. You talked about premeditation. Was the one You were the first one to raise the topic of premeditation. And when I talk to your fellow jurors uh, about what the law says about premeditation, did that kind of comport with or, or, or jive with what you previously thought of premeditation? Yes. Have you given that much? Is that something you think about a lot? Nope. Okay. And so you understand that when we talk about what, go, what went through somebody's mind, that I can prove that by showing you a series of facts that might give you some insight into that, right? Yes. Yeah. Tell me, what do you think, why might somebody commit a murder? Well, you're going to snap. Going to snap. Okay. Right. Now, if the judge doesn't instruct you on a could have snap defense, no. okay, 
that that's not a legal defense at law for you, if you determine that my view of the evidence is he could have snapped, are you going to render a verdict based on that or are you going to render a verdict based on the law? Okay. When I talked about, um, um, with your fellow jurors about the death penalty, I didn't see what your, um, your A, your AP is what you put on the questionnaire, you remember? You don't remember? Refresh? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I know that was like, what, two weeks ago, but um, you indicated, um, it, it's, the, the question was, do you have any strong feelings or opinions regarding the death penalty and you checked off B, generally appropriate with few exceptions. Do you remember that? Yeah. Okay. And like I talked with your other fellow jurors about, it's okay to have opinions and theories and whatever the case might be, but you have to leave those outside and follow the judge's instructions on how the death penalty works. You remember that? Yes. Yeah. And so, if the judge instructs you, if the mitigators outweigh the aggravators, you have to vote for life, can you do that? Yes. Yeah. Could you follow the judge's instructions in that regard? Yes. Yeah. Tell me what about you would make you a good juror. Something I don't know that I can't get from a questionnaire. Make me a good juror? Yeah. Very strong minded. Once I have my mind made up, that's it. Okay. Um, confident. And let me ask you a question. You say once I have my mind made up, that's it. Will you promise me that if Mr. Howard has a good idea, you'll listen to what he has to say? Yes. Right? I mean, it's a, it's a free flow. But guess what? You may have some really good ideas too, right? Yes. You're going to speak up and tell the other jurors what you think? Yes. Okay. What do you do What do you do you for a living? I don't have an occupation for you. I am a stay-at-home mom. Okay. Did you, did you, what did you do outside the home before having kids? Receptionist, secretary, okay. um, security guard. Okay. You got a gun? A cut wow. Yeah. You're like a jack of all trades. The the let's talk about the security guard issue a little bit because there's a kind of a component of law enforcement associated with that. Yeah. Can you assure us that despite that background experience you have, you're not going to treat this case any differently because it involves an allegation of murder of a law enforcement officer? No. And that you'll treat all law enforcement officers' testimony equally until you hear what they have to say. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you've never been a juror, or no, you have been a juror before. What kind of case? What, do you remember the charge? Gravely, he's not, not so much. Okay. Was it here or somewhere else? Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn, New York. How long did that one take? Like 45 days. 45 days? Four to five. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> okay. And did you all arrive at a verdict in that case? Yes. Okay. And can you tell us what it was? You don't have to. If you don't want to, that's fine. Guilty. Okay. And when you got back there, was there anybody who tried to inject something from the outside? Yes. Ah, tell us. You don't want to tell us? Okay. All right. But did, did you all as jurors obviously not allow that to happen? Okay. So you, and did you personally stand up against that person? All right. Great. All right. Um, you're going to follow the law in this case if you're selected as a juror? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. I appreciate your patience. Ms. Kitt, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Um, you're our other juror, juror in a murder case, right? Yes. Here or somewhere else? Here, thank you. How long ago? Five, six years ago. Okay. Well, you, you weren't on the same jury with uh, Mr. Minerva, were you? I don't think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, Stranger things have happened, trust me. Do you know if it was a death penalty case or not? It was not. Okay. Um, in terms of the experience of, as, as a juror in that case, it was kind of along the lines of what this camera and Colbert and I, Colbert and I talked about, when you got back in that room at the end of the day to begin your deliberations, was there anybody who tried to inject things into the case that were not legally to be considered? No. That's like, so for instance, if I were to tell you, we, we, you're selected as a juror in this case again, and you're um, back there, and you're deliberating, and somebody says, well, wait a minute now, 
I see what you're saying, and I see what the evidence is suggesting, but if we convict this guy, we got to go to the next phase. I'm having a problem with that. Do you recognize that that is not a legally reasonable doubt, and that would be something you'd have to fight against? Yes. Yeah. Okay, because that's what the law says? Yes. Yeah. Doesn't it make sense to you? I mean, do we want jurors making these decisions based on emotion? No. And doesn't that go both ways? Motions for the decedent's family, motions for the defendant or his family, we want to try to leave that out as much as humanly possible. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. And emotions don't really do anything to instruct us on what the truth is, do they? No. In fact, would you agree that they cloud or, or obscure the truth? Absolutely. All right. You um, indicated on your question also that you had family members or friends who were in law enforcement, right? Can you assure us that that will not affect or impact your view of the evidence or your view of the credibility of any witnesses in this case? Yeah. Because that's the law. Yeah. You also indicated on your questionnaire that you were a C on the death penalty questions and um, tell me what you thought about, because we hadn't talked about it, what you thought about the death penalty before you came in here. I believe it's appropriate in some cases, not all. Um, it is, I think it is a struggle for anyone to have to make that decision based on someone else's life. Okay. Um, but if it has to be that way. And you, do you, you know, I, I talked to some, some jurors about the fact that this is not a numbers game. I can have one aggravator that could be so weighty in, in nature that it overrides all multiple, multiple mitigators. Can you accept that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and if in the end of the day, I establish to you the presence of an aggravator that is weighty enough to warrant the imposition of the death penalty, could you make a recommendation to the judge in that regard? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Zimmerman. Yes. Yeah. Good morning, or good afternoon. Good afternoon. What did you think when I said that the burden of proof in this case is no different in, because it's a death penalty case versus uh, um, any other type of a case, a DUI or a petty theft? Did that surprise you? No. Okay. Um, can you think of any reason why you would hold me to a higher standard under the law than what the judge requires of me? You know, when I first started prosecuting all the way back in 1991, the law in the state of Florida was you cannot drive a motor vehicle with a breath, a breath, breath alcohol, blood alcohol level of 0.1 or above. And now it's 0.08. The legislature, basically the, government, the federal government said if you don't lower it, we're going to take your highway money away. Well, right in the middle when I was prosecuting those kind of cases, the law changed. And so I would come into this process with a whole bunch of jurors who their entire lives, the law has been a point one up. And I had to explain to them, now it's an 08 because that's what the legislature said. And some of the jurors said, I think it should be a 10, I can't follow that law. And that was fine. That's what this process is about, to identify those people. Is there anything in this case, or about this case, that you think would prohibit or impair you from following the law? No, sir. We talked a little bit with you the other day, but we didn't talk about the death penalty, and I know, um, well, first of all, you've indicated you know or are familiar with or have friends who are in law enforcement. Yes, sir. The question is the same. Can you promise us you will not treat this case any differently in terms of your view of the truth because of that? It will not impact you. Right. Or the credibility of witnesses? No. Okay. <clears throat> now, as it relates to the death penalty, you're another one of our teachers on the panel, right? Are you at that stage in your career where you've become somewhat, what did we say? Jaded. Jaded? Or no? I prefer salty. Salty? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. What does that mean? Well, you know, when you start your sugar, you know, everybody's really cute. Yeah. And they're eight and you love them. And then after about 15 years, you've heard it all, you've seen it all, you've been through everything. So... You get a little. That's like. Not that you're you're not understanding. You understand, but it takes a little bit to get to the sugar. So. You know, you, you say salty. Miss um, Senate says jaded, and 
you know, what we're really talking about are life experiences that form how we look at the world, if you will. Do you think I should have um, some concern that uh, Miss, uh, is it, I, I'm sorry, what is it? Galindo is 19 years old and doesn't have those type of experience? Should I, should, should I or anybody in this courtroom be concerned that because she's not salty or jaded that she might not be as good a juror? I don't think that would be fair to judge her moral purpose. With respect to the death penalty, had you given it a lot of thought before you came into this process? No. Okay, you put on there that you are a C. Yes. Do you foresee any problems or conflicts in your belief system that could affect your ability to follow the judge's instructions of the law on this issue? No. If you're convinced beyond a reasonable doubt of the existence of an aggravator, a dead child, for instance, and it outweighs the mitigation, could you make a recommendation to his honor for the death penalty? I would follow the law. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Dejuice, how are you, sir? Good. Did we talk? I can't remember if we talked yet or not. Yeah. Last week? Yeah. Okay. Um, when we first started talking about the concept of premeditation, did you have any preconceived notions in your mind as to what that would entail? No. No? And when I talk about what the instruction is now, do you feel comfortable with your ability to comply with that instruction? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, one of the other charges that we talked about a little bit um, with some of your other jurors was this concept of aggravated assault. And I want to go over the elements with you and ask you if you have any problems with it, if you follow it and can follow the instruction, okay? okay. All right, so aggravated assault. Not to be confused with battery, we are, as we've already established, is I would have, the state would have to prove that the defendant intentionally and unlawfully threatened by word or act to do violence to the victim, so it could be a verbal threat or doing some type of an act of violence, and that at the time, the second element is the defendant appeared to have the ability to carry out that threat, and the third element is the act created in the mind of the victim a well-founded fear that violence was about to take place and the assault was made with a deadly weapon, okay? Is there anything about your duty to have to detri determine what somebody's intent was or whether or not somebody was in fear that could create problems for you in, in, in terms of that instruction? You follow that? Yes, sir. And you can apply that instruction to the facts in this case? Yes, sir. You ever been a juror before? No, sir. Okay. What do you do for a living? I don't have anything on. I work for the city of Fort St. Lucie. Okay, yeah. and the department. Which department? Utilities department. Okay, how long have you been with them? About seven months. Did, isn't somebody else from the utilities department of Fort St. Lucie here? Or maybe I'm mistaken. No, it works. Public works. Okay, I'm sorry. You know, you know, Mr. DeJuice? No. No. Okay. And for the record, that was uh, uh, Mr. Grobart, right? Yes. Okay. Um, tell me, you indicated on your questionnaire that you were a C as it relates to the death penalty. Is that right? Appropriate in some cases, not in others? Yes, sir. Had you given any thought to the death penalty before you came in here today? At first, yes, I did. I thought, you know, somebody who would get the death penalty would be somebody who committed a whole bunch of murders and <coughs> did a lot of crazy stuff. But now that I hear what you have to say, I'll follow the law. Okay, and, and I'm glad you raised that. I talked about that with one of your fellow jurors. Um, you're not saying that you would only apply it to a serial killer or a mass murderer. You would be willing and to have an open mind to listen to what the aggravators are? Absolutely. Okay, and can you envision any circumstance under which you would, could find yourself, because of those initial beliefs you had, conflicted in your ability to follow the, the judge's instructions on the law? as it relates to the death penalty. No. Okay. And if at the end of the day, there's only one aggravator, but you deem that that aggravator is so weighty it warrants the imposition of the death penalty, and there are a whole mess of mitigators, but you don't think they're very weighty, and they don't outweigh the aggravator, could you make a recommendation to the court of death? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, you going to follow the law in this case, sir? Yes, sir. 
Thank you very much. Mr. Burgess. Yes. How are you, sir? Good. Um, now, your wife's on the panel, right? Yes. Okay, where is she? I forget. Oh, way over here. Okay, you guys haven't been talking about the case, right? No. He's not supposed to. Correct. Correct. All right. Um, and you, I mean, you get why we keep saying this, right? I mean, because we have to start all over again if, if, if that were to happen. So I'm not saying you did that. I'm just, I'm just a general comment to the group. Um, we talked a lot. You previously served on a jury, right? Yes. Now, Mr. Burgess, when we didn't get to talk to you about was your position regarding the death penalty, and you put B on the questionnaire. Now, understanding what the law is, that it's not it, it's a question of whether or not there's sufficient aggravation. Can you follow that instruction? Yes, I can. And if there isn't the aggravation or if the mitigation outweighs it, then your recommendation would have to be life, and could you follow that? Yes. Okay. You know, I don't know if you, if you guys ever if you need to take a massive restroom break, I'm sure the judge would consider well, it. Well, I'm going to stop about 4.30 because I can okay. tell everybody a little antsy. So give us about 15, 20 more minutes. We'll call it a day, okay? Um, so my point to you was, can you agree that you will follow the judge's instructions yes, on the law? Definitely. Okay. Any concerns or problems with the concepts, the legal concepts that we've addressed here? No. So I test you. Who has the burden of proof? You, you do. That's right. The state, right? I'm yes. the only one who's got to prove anything. Yeah. Right? Who is presumed innocent? The party over there. Okay. And you can follow those instructions yes. on the law? Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. I appreciate it. Oh, I should ask, what happens if you and Miss Burgess end up on this jury together? It's just still my opinion. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, she, you? she would not be an influence to me at all. Oh, man, I would not want to be in your house tonight, brother. <laughs> okay, but you know what I mean? I don't know. I've never seen it happen. I've had jurors, uh, husband and wife on panels before. You know, there's, yeah. there's no law against it, so it can happen. Yes. And um, I guess the, in the end, you would have to have your opinion. She'd have to have hers. Will you respect her opinion if it's different from yours? Of course. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Chamberlain. Yes, sir. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. Good. And we talked a lot last week, right? Okay. And uh, you had indicated to me uh, in our, or excuse me, indicated in your questionnaire that you had family members or friends who are in law enforcement, right? No. No? Okay, so I got that note wrong yesterday I, when I was filling this out. I don't, oh, you know what? I jumped ahead to Mr. Farinacci. Um, okay. You, no, you did not. All right. We talked a little bit. Like I said, let's talk about the death penalty. You indicated on your questionnaire that you were an A, that you thought it was always appropriate. You've now heard me talk about numerous circumstances under which a murder can happen and death is not even an option. Okay? Are you with me? Yes, sir. Can you accept that as the law? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, if we move to the, the, the two phases of the trial, there's this initial phase, right? We said he committed murder and therefore we got to prove it. Are you going to hold me to my burden? Yes, sir. Okay. Once we've established that burden, we go to the second phase, it's a whole new process. And I must convince you beyond a reasonable doubt, which we've talked about at length, of the existence of at least one aggravator. If I don't prove an aggravator, the law says you must vote for life. Will you follow that instruction? Yes. Despite your previously held opinions. Okay? And if I prove an aggravator, but you don't think it warrants death, like that one I talked about, the accomplice in a robbery, if you don't think that would warrant the death penalty, you would be required to vote life. Could you vote life? Yes. And then finally, even if I prove an aggravator, but you think the mitigators outweigh that aggravator, you would have to recommend life. Will you follow the law and recommend life? Yes. Okay. Are you going to follow the law in this case? Yes. Who's going to tell you what the law is? Are you a fair guy? Can you be a fair guy in this case? Yes. You were in the Marine Corps. Yes, sir. When you're in the United States Marine Corps, do they let you do pretty much whatever you want? <laughs> huh? No. Is there a set of rules and regulations that apply to how you conduct yourself in the United States Marine Corps? Did you follow those rules? 
When you didn't follow those rules, what happened? Bad things? Okay. There are rules in this courtroom. You're going to follow them? I mean, you, when, you, when you took the oath with the United States Marine Corps, you swore to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States, right? That's what this is all about. You going to follow the law? Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Farinacci, hi. You indicated on your questionnaire that you know, you, you own Maverick Boats? Or you're the... I work for them. Okay, you're the CFO over there? Correct. Okay. Maverick makes what? Uh, skiffs or? Skiffs, bay boats, and offshore. That's, they're all manufactured here in St. Lucie County? Correct. Oh, okay. Um, you indicated on your questionnaire that you know uh, law enforcement, maybe family members, friends, or acquaintances who are in law enforcement? Yes. Okay. And can I assume that's from being a longtime resident of this community? No, it's family. Okay. And again, the law is that that should not impact or influ influence how you view the evidence in this case. Can, can you accept that? Yes. So for instance, you know, if the evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt that a law enforcement officer was murdered, but I don't prove he did it, would you convict him anyway just because a law enforcement officer is dead? No, sir. Of course, because it's ridiculous, right? Yes. And that is what the law is. Also, law enforcement officers will take the stand. And you may come to the ultimate conclusion that the, the cop is a boo. And, his, and his, his work product is shoddy, and you really don't put much stock in them. Are you going to ignore your observations because you know somebody's in law enforcement? No, sir. Okay. Um, you had indicated uh, on your questionnaire that you were at sea, that it's sometimes appropriate, sometimes not appropriate with regard to the death penalty. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Do you feel any conflict, conflicting emotions or feelings inside that could impact or affect your ability to weigh the evidence in the penalty phase of this case and render an advisory opinion to the judge according to the law? No, sir. Okay. No strong feelings one way or other regarding the death penalty. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Flo, how are you? Um, oh, you, you are a cheer coach. I saw on your question, what school are you a cheer coach at? Okay. Um, you know, so games are not till later, right? You'll be able to get out to the, if you serve on this year. Huh? Oh, yeah, man. I'm telling you, we won't be here for 7 o'clock on Friday. <laughs> Unless you're back there deliberating, we might be here. So. Um, uh, what do you do? Uh, is that like a uh, side job? It is. Okay, what do you do? What's your primary occupation? I work in eye care, ophthalmology. Okay. Um, you same question I asked Mr. Farinacci, and that relates to many of your other jurors. You have indicated family members or friends who are in law enforcement. Is that correct? That's correct. Again, can you promise us that will not affect or impact how you view the facts in this case? Absolutely. As you sit here today, if you had to identify the most important thing second to following the law, what would what would be more important than finding the truth in this case? Say that again? Yeah, is there anything that would be more important than ultimately finding the truth? Yeah. Okay. And do you agree, can you accept the proposition for at least how this system works? The only way we can assure that your verdict in the end speaks the truth is if you follow the law. Follow the law. You've indicated on your questionnaire that you were, uh, you had family members or friends who might have had a problem with the criminal justice system or running with the law, right? Yes, okay, was that here or somewhere else? Um, okay, All right, and was there anything about how the prosecutors handled that or the cops or the courts that could create a problem for you? And you understand why we ask those questions, right? Um, when we talk about the death penalty, your questionnaire indicates that you are a, you put a C on there, right? Is this something about which you gave any thought or a little thought prior to, excuse me? Not prior to. No? 
And when you saw that questionnaire, obviously, and you saw the nature of the charges, it obviously became readily apparent to you that this potentially could be a death penalty case. Yes. Tell me your initial impression when, when you saw that. Well, I wasn't really sure what it meant exactly, other than the fact that, I mean, you know, the judge gave you literally, almost literally, all of the instructions you'll get in the penalty case. He didn't get into aggravators and mitigators because right. we're not supposed to talk about facts, but that's the law. You earn it. Right. Some of you heard more than one. Um, so any reason in your mind why you could not follow that instruction? And at the end of the day, if the aggravators in your mind outweigh the mitigators, would you be able to make a recommendation to the judge for death? Absolutely. Are you a fair person? Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Uh, Escalas? Yes, sir. Hi, and we talked a little bit, yes, sir. right? You were, you, this was great. So we're talking about, does anybody know law enforcement? Somebody asked Mr. Escalas, and he said, yeah, they come into Publix all the time. Uh, <laughs> right? Um, the uh, jury questionnaire indicated uh, that you were a C as it relates to the death penalty, right? Yes, sir. Okay, and uh, before you came into this process, or, or I'll ask you the same question I asked uh, just a moment ago. When you sat down and you started filling out the questionnaire and then you saw the nature of the charges and then the questions regarding the death penalty, obviously 